is a very interesting CV and a lot of areas and a lot of different um, disciplines and that's why I put only a sub, uh, sub information because there are so many other things I, could, I couldn't understand actually to explain to you that's why uh, the things that I understood I put together so first of all he undergraduated in Tel Aviv University in Mathematics and Philosophy before that you started with Philosophy of Science and then you finished the year and then you had your PhD in computer science at Yale and uh, you attempted to provide, is it attempted to be correct or you provided, uh, I should say, provided an algorithmic interpretation to Popper's philosophical approach to scientific discovery. The Wikipedia says attempted and he says it's not attempted. <laughs> so, and as a postdoctoral fellow at Weizmann Institute, uh, he invented a high level programming language for Caroline's and then afterwards, uh, we founded an Israeli internet software company, Yubi, Yubi, Yubi. Yubi uh, to develop virtual devices. And this is like today's instant messaging system. And then you that other companies uh, bought it in the States and then implemented it for here. I will put it here. And then, this is very interesting, you self study molecular biology. And this is very interesting model actually learn as professors how we self-study things while having students from that area. So we worked with smart molecular biology PhD students and they told you actually the content and this was the study. This is very interesting. Also the lab stuff, how we work with them. And you built a computer from biological molecules guided by a vision of a doctor in a study. So this is not an attention, it's a really good one. And then now, afterwards, at the Weizmann Institute, you have designed and successfully implemented various molecular computing devices. Currently, and as you see, there are different disciplines, multidisciplinary and also interesting, so entrepreneur, but also an artist. And he has a, a band, and he's a founder of a Warwick Band. And um, you had also a lot of performances, and are currently also practicing. Uh, as an artist. And more probably interesting for us the two ERC plots. So um, I don't know in which areas, but maybe you can tell us them. Well, uh, one is on molecular computers and one is uh, on the human cell image. So they're both sort of on the interface of biology and computer science. Yes. So um, today it's about democracy and I think this is one of your current projects and you will inform us about computational foundation for it and short answer is that you know I've been working for the last decade or so about 
cancer related uh, research. And I think uh, the state of democracy is even worse than the state of cancer. Uh, so uh, we should spend more energy fixing democracy than curing cancer. That's my, uh, my thinking about this. And that's part of the reason why I'm doing this. And there are really two, the, the term democracy has two meanings. One is the soft version, uh, which is uh, uh, basically try to improve current democracy in, in, in an incremental way, try to make governments or cities typically it works in the lower levels and in the cities, uh, try to make the citizens participate more in the governance uh, processes. And I think uh, participatory budgeting is an example. Many cities now involve some form of participatory budgeting. It's uh, you know, a very small portion of the budget, usually 3%, 2%, 3%, 5% that the citizens have some influence or can decide to some degree what to vote upon. And there is another kind of parallel direction in the new legislation called crowd law, which attempts to encourage governing bodies to engage citizens in the, in, in the legislation process. So this is the soft, incremental, I would say, approach. And there is the hard, hard the democracy, which say, OK, let's throw everything and start from scratch, basically. And, uh, uh, believes that, uh, that the democracies are, as we know them, are broken uh, and we should uh, try to restore equality and, and the problem with the representative democracies is that representatives, one elect, once elected, they work so hard to be elected, they never want to give power. Mm -hmm. So the only way to, to distribute, redistribute power is, in some sense, by external, <laughs> external means. So the French tried one thing, which is killing everybody. Uh, so Hopefully we can fix uh, democracy without killing everybody, but we need external means and maybe technology could be this external means that, that will help us do this. Uh, so yeah, hopefully can technology, uh, technology can achieve this revolution without having to kill everybody. So, let's say we want to build a new democracy. Who will give us guidance? Uh, and, um, one approach is to, when, when we build systems, is uh, you know, system engineering, engineering is to interview the customer, right? Interview the customer, write specifications, and the customer says, I want X, Y, and Z. We say, OK, we'll build you a system that has X, Y, and Z. Please sign here. Then he signs, and then we build it. And then if he succeeds, he, he has to pay whether he agreed or he agrees with that. That's what they really meant or not, but that's sort of one method. So who will give us specifications for the democracy? Well, I think one approach is, is uh, uh, to go back to the specifications of democracy and, and my favorite uh, document is the 1789 Declaration of uh, the Rights of Man and Citizen, the French document. And uh, there we can uh, look at the values that, that it has there and, and if you try to extract the values from it, the two key values are equality and sovereignty, uh, but there are more values, the preservation of basic rights, but the natural and inimpressible human rights, liberty, property, safety, resistance against against oppression, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of assembly, and uh, transparency, these are all written there, and many others. But in this talk I will focus on, the, on two values, uh, equality and sovereignty, and discuss how we can we achieve uh, these two values, equality and sovereignty, in media So that, that's the focus of uh, my talk. And what, what does equality mean in, in a democracy? Uh, well, if we follow this 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, the first thing that is that all articles in the, in the Declaration are universal. They don't say, you know, the rich people have these rights and the poor people have these rights, or the, uh, even though they, it's written in these days in, in terms of men, I think today we interpret it as people, not men. Uh, so uh, all people, men and women, have uh, equal rights under these articles. And uh, they specifically talk about equality in many contexts. One is that people are equal in their rights. Uh, all citizens have the right to contribute personally to the formation of the law. So, so uh, legislation should be have people have equal rights in legislation, uh, and law must be equal for all. And all citizens being equal in size, equally admissible to public positions. So anyone can be elected to be a judge or or a governor or. or Member of the parliament, etc. And uh, also regarding money, they say that uh, uh, the, the cost of the 
government or that uh, it should be equally distributed, but they have this progressive clause saying according to their ability to pay. So equality is all over the, the declaration. What does equality mean in e democracy? How can we achieve it? Well, the first thing we would say, of course, is one person, one vote. But in general, we can have, you know, uh, um, uh, manipulation of, uh, of, uh, of votes and, and uh, false uh, identities in votes, but especially in e democracy, it's a, it's a, it's a big uh, danger, a big challenge that uh, fake accounts uh, uh, can be much more easily created. And uh, the technical term is symbols, uh, but who heard, who heard the term symbols before? Okay, it's, it's a kind of a strange term. It's supposed to be a technical term, but its origin is kind of strange, so I'll just tell it to you. Uh, civil is just the name of a person, of a woman, who was the first woman to be diagnosed, or oh, well, to be published, publicly diagnosed, or it was a big, there was a famous book written about, about her in the early days of uh, psychology, psychiatry research, that she was the, uh, had the uh, multiple personality disorders, so she had 17 personalities. So the computer science people said, okay, here's a person with 70 personalities, it's a good, it's a way to call fake accounts. I, I don't like this, but that's the technical term that it stuck. So that's, when we say symbols, we mean fake accounts. Uh, it's, a, it's a short word for fake accounts. Uh, so what can we do about it? That's, that's a big question. And another big question for equality, which we tend to overlook in democracy, is uh, not only one, uh, that, that everyone has equal right to vote, but who decides what to vote on? And uh, the French Declaration specifically says that everyone has the right to contribute to the uh, formation of the law. So people have the right not just to vote directly or indirectly on proposals, but actually participate in the drafting of proposals. And this has been long forgotten uh, in today's democracies. Uh, so how can we achieve equality in uh, drafting proposals? And I'll uh, uh, first focus on, on this question. And in uh, uh, this question, uh, we can talk about civil prevention. How can we prevent civils from joining the electorate or the group or the democracy, the e-democracy? If they succeed in joining, how can we detect them and how can we eliminate them? So this is a, a very kind of broad and big question. There's a lot of research about it. And uh, we are also working on this. And uh, the second topic is even if we're successful in prevention, detection, and eradication, there will always be a few fake accounts around. So what do we do about democratic decision processes in the presence of fake accounts? How can we make the decision processes resilient to some amount of signals which will always be present? So in this talk, I will focus uh, uh, on the second question, how can we make uh, democratic decision processes civil resilient? And while we work on this question as well, it's still work in progress and we haven't published anything, so I'll, uh, I'll discuss it right now, but it's a, it's a fundamental and important question. It's, not a, it's maybe the first mo and most important question in e-democracy uh, work. So that's, uh, that, that's one, talk, one question I'm talking about. And uh, uh, regarding who decides what to vote on, um, and achieving equality there. Um, to do this, we must assume that many people can make proposals and we can, it's not just voting yes, no, one proposal, we somehow should be able to vote on many proposals that different people present, and we need to be able to, to address this. And uh, there is a field of study called the social, social choice theory. Who heard of social choice theory in this audience? Okay. So it's a field of study that originated from economics started many years ago, as so we'll see, several, many, several centuries ago, but uh, in its modern form, it's about 75 years old, uh, and, and um, it started in economies, in economics, uh, the work of Arrow, but slowly moving into computer science, and there's now computational social choice, there's a lot of work on this, on this, uh, on this topic. So, social choice theory specifically addresses the question of how do we decide among multiple alternatives. And uh, the other question is, okay, assuming we can decide, how can we make, prepare such alternatives and who, who controls which alternatives are put to vote, etc. And again, these are two very important questions. 
Uh, but in this talk, I will discuss only the first topic, uh, because we have worked on this attack and uh, that has been already published. The second topic we also work upon, but we have preliminary results that have not been published yet, so I have less to say about it. But these are two equally important uh, topics. So, um, so, but to summarize the fact that it's, we need really to achieve equality, we need similar resilient decision processes, not just on a single alternative, but on multiple alternatives. So if we combine these two, uh, we need uh, civil resilient social choice theory. And that's really something that, uh, that we have uh, preliminary results that I'm going to discuss about. How can we have uh, decisions on multiple alternatives which are resilient to signals? And so let's, let's, let's talk about this. Let's first start easy. Uh, let's talk about civil resilient voting on one proposal. If we just uh, use majoritarian decision making, if there's a majority, we say yes. Okay, uh, uh, and normally, when we have one proposal, the choice is between two alternatives, the proposal and the status quo, and we say yes if we favor the proposal, no if we favor the status quo. Okay, so we say, okay, we don't want this proposal, so whatever was before stays. Now, normally, it's enough for her to have one vote, you know, to, to change. One, one majority of one person can change it. But if we suspect there could be fake accounts, we don't want this to depend on this one fake account, one civil to, to decide the election, so we need to do something, something better. And uh, this is what, uh, how we define the notions of civil resilience. We have two notions. One is uh, safety. Civil safety is the inability of civils to change the status quo against the will of the majority. So we would like that if the majority do not if there is no majority support for proposals, the civils cannot push, this, cannot cause this proposal to, to be accepted. Only if there is true majority among the genuine voters, then this proposal will be accepted. So that's the notion of safety. Civils cannot, cannot take us to a direction that there is no majority support for it. But of course we can be safe and just stay here and never move. And this, is, this addresses the definition of safety. That's why we also have the notion of liveness that uh, if the honest voters really, really want to go somewhere, the citizens cannot stop them. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying a simple majority, maybe we need a bigger majority, but if we really want to get there, then uh, liveness means that with sufficiently large majority among the genuine voters, we can eventually get there and the citizens cannot stop us. So these are the two requirements of civil resilience. That's how we define it. It's a combination of safety and liveness. Which, of course, notions that are borrowed from, uh, from uh, concurrency theory, which are very useful. So, how can we achieve safety and liveness? Uh, well, uh, here I just, uh, in the interest of time, yes, I will, uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, just tell you the results. And, uh, Quite simple to prove, uh, but uh, the idea is quite simple. Uh, let's see, we have these are all the voters, and these are the seagulls, okay, uh, and these are the genuine voters, all the genuine voters. So we would like a proposal to be taken only if there is a majority uh, among, the, among the honest, uh, among the genuine voters. Okay, so we would like to have a supermajority that comes somewhere here. So it's uh, so if this is half, okay, it's not enough to have half. We need we need to go some more. How much we need? We need half the amount of civils to go beyond that. And if if only if you go half the amount of civils, then uh, we know that there is a majority among the, the genuine voters. Okay, so that's this is the first result uh, by hand waving. So if uh, delta is, the, is the, some extra behind uh, the, the, beyond simple majority, then it is safe against two, two delta civil penetration. So for example, uh, if there is uh, here uh, one, one fifth civils, then we have to go one tenth uh, extra. So we have to uh, uh, we need a 55 percent majority. So if, if we uh, have one third, then we need to go uh, one sixth. So one half plus one sixth is two thirds. Okay. So if we have one third, if we have one third 
skills. Here, we need a two-third majority to ensure that there is majority among, among the women's voters. And what if everyone is civil except me? Okay. So what kind of majority do we want? Every, all the voters are civil. I'm the only one. So what kind of majority do we need? Well, if we go by consensus, you know, we require consensus, then we're safe. Because if only if I agree to something, then it will happen. So, so our approach to supermajority is resilient up to everyone being civil except me. Okay? So it's pretty strong. Uh, you just have to be a, a big enough uh, supermajority. Uh, is this clear? But you need to know how many civils there are. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, this is the other question that I'm not going How to do civil detection, eradication, uh, prevention, etc. So all this assumes that we have some upper bound on how many civils. No, we don't even know we have upper bound. Now, upper bound can be estimated. You can do statistical sampling. Let's say you have you know, a million voters, but you cannot check all of them, but you can statistically sample them. You, you check you know, a large enough sample, and you can get a good estimate of the civil penetration, and then you set the bar high enough. But that's an excellent question. So this assumes that we know some bound on the, on the amount of civil penetration, and if we are wrong, then we lose. Okay, so we should be we should have a good estimate on the amount of civils. Okay. It also assumes that the civils are of one opinion. No, this is the worst case. In the worst case. In the worst case. In the worst case. Uh, I'm almost talking about the worst case. Now, of course, if the civils are divided, then uh, we can, uh, we, we're in a better shape. Yeah. If, if all the civils want to go there, I want to go there only if there's a majority among the genuine voters. If the civils have no opinion, then of course we're fine. But the worst case is that all the civils are organized and there is there are bots that are operated by a single person, maybe, or a mafia that is tightly connected and they all want to go there and we want to say, okay, maybe we can go there, but only if there's a majority that want to go there. Okay. So, as I said, two uh, super majority of two-thirds is resilient to one-third civil penetration, three-quarters is resilient to, vote, to all vote, to half the voters being civils, and a consensus is resilient to everyone but me being civil. Uh, but above one third civil penetration, liveness cannot be guaranteed. Why is that? Uh, because uh, if there is uh, one third civil penetration, okay, and they don't want to go there, okay, so they say, no, I don't want to go there, but we need two thirds majority, so we need a consensus in order to go there. So on the, on the one third, it's, but if it's one, one third plus one, then even a consensus will not give us the two-thirds majority that is needed, so we cannot go there even, even if all genuine voters want to go there. So we really need, so we really need a civil penetration to be below one-third. Uh, so we need civil penetration to be below one-third to uh, achieve lightness. Okay? Uh, otherwise, lightness cannot be guaranteed. So this is interesting uh, uh, for those who are familiar with concurrency and Byzantine agreement. This tipping point of one third is exactly the tipping point of Byzantine agreement. So I don't think it's a coincidence. You know, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, point to have. So um, anyway, so that's so we so basically we're, the, the, the the bottom line here is that safety can be guaranteed no matter what is the civil penetration as long as we know we know it and can done it from above. Liveness can be guaranteed only if civil penetration is below one third and we can bound it by a bound which is below one third. Okay. So this is all for voting on one proposal. But I told you that we're interested in voting on many proposals. Okay, so how can we be uh, civil resilient when we have to decide among many proposals? Uh, it looks kind of a completely different problem, but actually if we take the right attitude, it's almost the same problem. I'll try to explain why. Uh, well, when you vote on one proposal, there is a choice between only two alternatives. The, the proposal and the status quo, which we call reality, as I said before. Now, social choice theory, theoretically, or uh, claims to generalize voting on one proposal to voting on many proposals, except that those who studied social choice theory 
sure you know that they forgot the status quo. So there is no requirement uh, uh, that when you vote on end proposal, you actually vote on end plus one alternatives when it's reality. Okay, so this is our requirement. We propose that this open, this will always be the case, but this is not the case with standard social choice theory. So social choice theory uh, forgot reality when generalizing voting from one to end proposals. So in this particular important sense, social choice theory is not does not generalize voting on one proposal to voting on multiple proposals because voting on one proposal is really voting on two proposals, one of them is reality and therefore the, the correct generalization when you vote on n proposals is voting on n plus one proposals, one of which is reality or the status quo. So we believe it's not a small thing, you know, it has many implications and there's a whole paper, there's a paper that wrote about this independently of civil resilience, but specifically for civil resilience, it's crucial to have the reality in order to achieve civil resilience when voting on multiple proposals. Okay, so uh, first some quotes. Uh, status quo is the only solution that cannot be vetoed, but if you allow in social choice theory, it says, okay, you can have an alternative, you can veto the status quo by not including it in the end proposals. Even Kenneth Arrow, in his second edition, he said, status quo has a built-in edge over all alternative proposals, but it doesn't change the mathematics in the second edition. To include it, it just says, you know, just, just know that it's there. Uh, another scholar of, uh, uh, of social choice theory, it's another branch of social choice theory called spe special models, and if you've studied it or, or know about it, it's, it's a whole school of thought in so social choice theory. But he also says that the um, uh, interest of the status quo lies in the simple fact of its existence. Uh, the elementary distinction in status quo and its idealized alternatives is often overlooked. Any proposal for change involves the status quo as necessary starting point. Okay. So it also says we must have the status quo. And mathematically, social choice theory forgot it. Now, uh, neither recognizes the built-in edge of the status quo nor prevents its need. So what we propose. Uh, we propose to add the status quo as a, uh, adding reality, which is just a shorter word for the status quo, as an ever-present, always re relevant and dynamically changing alternative. Uh, ever-present, so it cannot be vetoed. Always relevant because it determines preferences and there is a whole philosophical discussion that I will not get into, but if reality is, is here, then we will rank these alternatives one way, but if reality is here, then we may rank them differently because this is easier to get than this one, or the cost of getting this alternative is different depending on what is the current state of things. So we cannot rank alternatives in the abstract, we have to rank alternatives in the context of, of, uh, uh, of the status quo, of reality. Okay. Uh, and then I'm to change it because, you know, we, we make a vote today when the state of things is some one thing, then we may make a vote in the next year and the state of things will be different. So our ranking will be different depending on what is the state of things, what's reality. It's not eternal. Our ranking is not eternal, it, it, and reality is not eternal, it changes over time. Okay. Uh, so we propose uh, uh, to, to incorporate reality, and what does it mean? Uh, it has implications for voting on multiple alternatives. And first, I recall a uh, member secretary, he's another uh, old scholar, and uh, basically said that we should elect, when we have multiple alternatives, we should elect the alternative that is preferred over any other alternative by a majority of the voters. Okay? That's a very simple idea. You can we do, we do a tournament between all the alternatives, like a tennis tournament, and if, someone, if an alternative wins, match against any other alternative, this is the one that should, should be elected. But unlike in tennis, you can have cycles. You don't always have a conversation winner, and it's studied, it has been studied a lot. And there are many, 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 many answers what to do when you have cycles. Okay, so when there's no conversation winner. And um, so that's kind of standard social choice theory, and in some sense, Eros theorem that says that um, you can have not have good decision processes. Really, it's a generalization of this notion that you can have a cycle that 
uh, this alternative is preferred by a majority over this alternative, and uh, this alternative is preferred over this, and this alternative is preferred over this, so if you, if you can just go in cycles trying to find the winner, and you never find it. But, if we add the uh, reality, then uh, we can use its built-in edge to break other cycles, and the rule of reality and work on the set criteria, and the criteria, criteria is very simple. First of all, you consider all your alternatives that are preferred over reality. Okay, so we throw away everything that, that is less preferred than the current status quo. Well, if, if people prefer the status quo over something, we should not consider it, we should not go backwards, we shouldn't, we shouldn't go to worst things, worst states in the status quo. Well. And then, if there is a kind of seminar among the, those that beat reality, we take it. But if there is no, so there are people who prefer other things, but they are completely confused about what they really want, then <coughs> we say and stick with reality. So it's a very simple rule. There are more complicated rules, more permissive rules uh, in, in, in this theory. I will not get into it, but we can, we can stick with this uh, very simple one, saying, okay, if there's a clear way we do it, otherwise we stay with reality in the status quo. It turns out that once you've taken this approach, all the mathematics that we did before, applies here. So we can, we can define safety, again, the inability of civilians to change the status quo against the will of the majority of the voters, but again, the change is in any alternative whatsoever. And liveness is the same definition, the ability of one's voters to change the status quo, moving it to some alternative. So the def definitions stay the same, and even the results in terms of supermajority, uh, safety, and uh, uh, liveness, this is a tipping point, all stay the same. Once we adopt uh, reality aware social choice, uh, yeah. So once we once we stick reality to social choice, then our previous result of voting on one alternative against reality is are essentially the same. Our argumentation is the same voting on multiple alternatives against the reality. Uh, and in addition, uh, there's a nice algorithm uh, agenda of the proper voting process to to achieve that. Uh, we go even further back in history and uh, to Ramon uh, uh, his Catalan. So I learned, I practiced quite a lot how to say his name and I hope I, I can succeed. Ramon Hu. Okay, anyone Catalan here? Okay, so you can correct <laughs> But it's not, trust me, it's Ramon Hu. Uh, and he was, he was born in 1232 and died in. 1360, and he wrote uh, several articles on voting. This is actually the simplest one. He wrote more complicated things, uh, more he, he anticipated some of the cycle breaking methods that, that developed much later after Condorcet. But his first paper, or most simplest paper, is proposing the amendment agenda. It's very simple. It says arrange all alternatives in a list, vote the first against the second, the winner against the third, and so on. So you will keep, keep the winner for the next round, and the final winner is left. Very simple method. You don't need a computer, you just raise your hands, who is for, who is against, you know, you write on a piece of paper, that's it. Very simple. Uh, it does elect a conversation winner if one exists, because the conversation winner will, winner will, elect, will win every match and will remain. But it doesn't detect the cycle, so if you recycle, it will choose some member of the cycle. Okay, so that's, that's a drawback. But uh, still used by parliaments, including in the US, and because it does not detect and break cycles in a systematic way. The order matters a lot. So there's a lot of struggles and maneuvers and strategizing when this is used, on what, what, what is the order of proposals in order for, for the proposal to win given if there is a cycle. So, so anyway, that's the uh, uh, uh amendment agenda. And we can extend it slightly and, uh, and uh, use it for our purpose. So first of all, we consider only alternatives preferred over reality. So we throw away everything that reality wins. And we don't use a simple majority in these pairwise matches. We use uh, a delta supermajority, a simple resilient supermajority. So we move forward. We, we, we choose a winner only if we choose. We start, uh, uh, I didn't say. Uh, OK. We, I didn't say it, but we start with reality. Reality is the first alternative. So we, this, we replace it with something only if it wins over reality by uh, delta supermajority. And then we replace it again only if the other alternatives win by delta supermajority.
priority. If not, the alternative that, that one way of reality stays. And uh, at the end, we take the winner and vote it against all remaining alternatives that has not been voted against. And only if it wins by a delta supermajority over every other alternative, we elect it. Which means it's a, it's a, uh, it's a civil, resilient, safe, conducive But if it does not win everyone else by a delta supermajority, then we retain reality. We're set. Uh, so it's realized it's called the second system civil resilient elections among multiple alternatives ensuring, ensuring safety and liveness uh, and breaks uh, uh, cycle, okay, it doesn't fall into cycles. Civil efficient can be realized by show of hands, okay, again, you can just say who is for, who is against, you don't need complex computers, algorithms, max flow, wind you know, all these complicated things. Nothing is needed, can be done with the show of hands. But yeah, I forgot to say that we start with reality. So, it can be implemented, it can be realized. So, this whole approach of civil resilient social choice can be implemented simply on a computer and even without a computer if we physically need. Even though this, the focus was e democracy, but it's nice to know that it's so simple that we don't need, we don't need really a computer to do it. Uh, okay, so this summarizes my whatever, what I wanted to say about civil resilient social choice. Assuming, I assume two things, I assume many things. I assume that uh, we have these other mechanisms that we talk about, preventing signals from entering, detecting, eradicating them, and somehow keeping the number of signals low, not zero, but low. Think about 2%, 3%, 5%, you know, 7%, maybe something manageable, so we, we can keep it low. And uh, we can have a good estimate on how many signals there are and have a bound about it. And we have a mechanism for egalitarian mechanism for proposal making. So all these assumptions, which we work on separately, but they don't have results to report on yet. And assuming all these, then we know how to take multiple alternatives and have civil resilient social choice, vote upon them in a way that is egalitarian and civil resilient. So that's the first uh, uh, statement on how to achieve equality. The second value I mentioned, let's see how much time I have. The second value I mentioned is uh, sovereignty. And uh, let's talk about it a little bit. What does sovereignty mean? First of all, in this declaration, there's an article, a whole article devoted to it. It says, the principle of any sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. So the nation is a sovereign, not the king. This was, remember this was, before the sovereign of the king, so now they say no, it's not the king, it's the people. Nobody, no individual can exert authority which does not emanate expressly from it. So the people are the sovereign. Okay? And what does it mean in e-democracy? We have no defined territory, we have no property, so in e-democracy, what does it mean to be a sovereign? Well, uh, at least one thing, you know, e-democracy is held together, conduct its operation by electronic means, then at least it should have sovereignty over these means. So at least the e-democracy should have, should be, should have control over the, its electronic, the electronic means by which it operates. So no third party can pull the plug and say, okay, we didn't pay the bill, tip by, or we changed the rules, sorry, we don't like e-democracies anymore, but, okay? Um, which, of course, will happen in, in, in bad democracies or non-democracies that we'll see that the democracy is emerging in number. So how can we have sovereignty over these electronic means? Uh, well, say, okay, on the internet, you know, if you have a democracy, you, have, you are also have sovereignty, and it's not quite true. Consider Wikipedia as maybe the best example most uh, powerful example of democratic conduct on the internet, you know, people write and their editors and they argue and they vote and, and it's some sort of uh, active and live and successful, very successful democracy. But are the people the sovereign of Wikipedia, the users, the editors, are they the sovereign? The answer is no. The sovereign is the governing board of a company called Wikimedia Inc. Okay? And what does it mean? It means that this board, which we, nobody knows, you don't know who they are, and their names are published on the internet, you can search Wikimedia Inc. and see who is the board, but they are fully authorized tomorrow to decide to pull the plug on Wikipedia. Tomorrow they can make a decision.
Indian story, we have no money, we are facing bankruptcy. Our fiduciary responsibility is to shut Wikipedia down to avoid bankruptcy, and then they will pull the plug. So they are the sovereign of Wikipedia. Not the users, not the authors, not the editors, nobody. They are the sovereign of Wikipedia. It's true that the license is such that, that someone can copy the whole Wikipedia and start a new one and it will not violate any rules, etc. But that's beside the, the point. The point is that democracy, even internet democracy, does not guarantee or does not entail sovereignty. They're two independent issues. So, what about sovereignty? How can we achieve sovereignty? Uh, how can we achieve sovereignty? How can a new democracy be the sovereign if it's an electronic means of conduct? Well, we have new technologies, uh, blockchain distributed ledger technologies and cryptocurrencies. They are the first, to my knowledge, the first demonstration of sovereignty uh, uh, on the internet. Because the participants in a cryptocurrency are its sovereign. Nobody can kill it, nobody can unplug it. As long as there are people who are willing to spend money to run Bitcoin uh, mining their uh, machines, then Bitcoin will continue to exist. Okay, so there's no third party or super user or government that can unilaterally shut it down, control it, subvert it, etc. To a degree. Uh, so a uh, democracy may operate theoretically a distributed ledger that hosts a citizen registry, a legislative registry, a financial registry, so all the things that the democracy needs. Uh, that they can be updated with newly, newly admitted citizens, newly enacted legislation, new financial transactions, including minting new coins if the democracy has money. So all this theoretically can happen on a distributed ledger and support the operation of an e-democracy in a way that, the, that ensures the sovereignty of the participants of the e-democracy over its electronic means, which is no small thing. But, there are several problems with the current cryptocurrency protocols, and I'd like to, to uh, call them. Uh, the first one is that uh, proof of work, which is a popular protocol used today by Bitcoin, Ethereum, and most other cryptocurrencies, is environmentally harmful, uh, wasting on purpose by design. You have to prove that you've solved the puzzles that nobody needs. Uh, enormous amounts of energy. So uh, I, I, I lost track of it, but uh, it keeps. Uh, going up and up, and I think the, the most recent one is uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. So I think uh, Bitcoin today, on a on a moment to moment basis, it uses the same amount of energy that the whole uh, uh, Czech Republic uh, uses. The whole amount of energy the Czech Republic uses. Uh, a few months ago, it was Israel, but it passed Israel. Okay, so Israel is 8 million people, you know, doing the laundry, you know. Air conditioning, this, that, 8 million people. Bitcoin uses more energy than Israel today on a daily basis. So it's environmentally harmful and it does so on purpose by design. It's not a, it's, it's a, it's not a, it's a feature, it's not a bug. That's how it's designed. Uh, second, proof of work is inherently plutocratic. To make money uh, mining Bitcoins, you need to have money. And the richer you are, the more powerful servers you, you, you have, the more coordinated you are, the better economy of scale you have, then you make more money. Proportionally to the amount you invest, not just uh, uh, not linearly proportionally, but, but more than that. So, so uh, proof of work makes the rich richer. It's not egalitarian, it's plutocratic. Uh, plutocracy is the rule of the money, uh, not the rule of the people. Now there is a proof of stake, which is an experimental protocol that's being experimented with, but it's not clear if, it will, if, if cryptocurrencies will switch to it. Ethereum claims it may switch to it one day, but there are still arguments and discussions. And because of history, you know, even if it switches to it, there will be a hard fork. Someone switch to it, someone not. So there will be two Ethereum, or by then four, because it's already forked in the past. Um, so. Uh, it is sustainable, but it's even more plutocratic, especially plutocratic than proof of uh, work. Proof of work is plutocratic indirectly, proof of stake is plutocratic directly. You have to put money on the table to participate. And the more money you put, the more you get. So, uh, and 
because of the difficulties of all these changes in cryptocurrencies, this whole area of cryptocurrency governance is extremely active. Uh, how many people here follow the cryptocurrency kind of uh, world? Okay. Uh, cryptocurrencies for the last, uh, I don't know what the number is, uh, two months ago it was uh, 1700, maybe today it's 2000, 2000 cryptocurrencies listed on the cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, and it's a black hole for talent because everyone wants to make money, so all the smart people go there to make more to make money, and it's enormous, enormous sink of talent. And there are good ideas being developed there, and, and, and that's why there are 2,000 different currencies, each one has a different idea. I'm talking here about uh, elements of the currency that are related to the currency. So Say it again. Um, you were mentioning here the elements that are related to the currency aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But as I understand, the digital ledger is sort of database of transactions. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that element be more interesting to a database, that to the e-democracy? What transactions are taking place? Yeah. Exactly, but I'm getting to the governance question. Can I ask can I ask a question before? Why do you need blockchain for a super ring? Like this is a did not catch because the thing is somebody cannot plug off. Yeah. I, I think okay. it because it couldn't be any other distributed environment where you have some re reciprocal dependency. Maybe. Maybe. But to achieve it, eventually you will, you will have to redesign or incorporate in it many components of uh, distributed ledger and cryptocurrency. Now, I'll, I'll try to explain. It, it's cryptocurrencies and distributed ledgers are very kind of tightly coupled and they work because all the pieces fit together. Uh, you want it distributed, but for people to operate it, they need incentives. So the cryptocurrency is the is the oil, the fuel, that gives people incentives to keep running it. If you don't have incentives, people will not run it. But if you put the incentive mechanism outside of the system, then suddenly someone external has control over how to incentivize people. But this is also in democracy, you have rules outside the system. Mm. Let me put it this way. Because you are, you are building a labyrinth of a labyrinth of a labyrinth. No, no, no. It's not, it's, I don't think it's so complicated in, in that sense. First of all, I should say that I've been, while I was doing biology, I've been, think, I was, I've been thinking about the, uh, democracy for quite some time. And this question of how to achieve sovereignty within a democracy was really bothersome to me. And I was thinking about it for a few years and couldn't find a solution, a good solution. Until cryptocurrencies came and I said, ah, you know, and there's this, uh, the first example was the DAO, the, distributed autonomous uh, whatever organization over a theory, which is the first example of a democratic, <coughs> plutocratic, but so, almost democratic organization that was, was um, autonomous. And you can try to decompose the elements of, of why cryptocurrencies work and reconstruct them, but actually that's what I'm trying to do. So maybe, maybe you will see that, uh, maybe you can go visit it again when, when I finish. Okay? So, what I'm saying is that today, cryptocurrencies were designed without a governance mechanism physically. And uh, you know, Satoshi uh, Nakamoto uh, designed Bitcoin and said, okay, this is it, it's going to run forever, period. But now people want to modify it because it doesn't scale, because they want bigger records, because they want to buy it, uh, side ledgers, because they want this and that. And they have to agree on how to change it, but there is no mechanism in Bitcoin to agree on anything except on the next block. But if you want to change the rules by which the next block is designed or built or agreed upon, then there's no meta-level governance mechanism. So part of this uh, enormous sink of talent that goes to cryptocurrencies is devoted to designing new governance mechanisms. And there are second and third generation cryptocurrencies which are being designed with a governance mechanism built in. One famous example is Tezos, T-E-Z-O-S, which raised a quarter of a billion dollars in their ICO and then collapsed into governance uh, problems. But they proposed to do governance uh, built into the cryptocurrencies, but they're out. But the point I'm trying I want to say is that all these people, all this technology, all this talent is devoted to devising plutocratic mechanisms, which you vote with your money. So they, they're all designing governance mechanisms with 
One coin, one vote. Not one person, one vote. So the whole group of right. Okay, so that's this point. Now, uh, can an e-democracy employ plutocratic governance? Uh, like a, uh, the next Bitcoin with plutocratic governance, so it can achieve sovereignty? No, if it also wants to uphold equality. So it seems that there is a contradiction between wanting to preserve equality on the one hand and achieving sovereignty at least using existing technologies of cryptocurrency to value it. So is there really a contradiction? I believe there isn't. And uh, we claim that equality and sovereignty can be achieved simultaneously uh, in HHD, the e-democracy that conducts its operation via a distributed ledger. And how can we achieve that? Uh, let me say more, more uh, with more, more words. That the solution to the problem of granting unique, truthful e-citizenships, that's the uh, one person, one vote solution. How can we ensure that every person has one vote? If we, this is, of course, we need to give each person one account, one e-citizenship in this e-democracy, would allow a solution for democratic governance by the distributed ledger of the end of the distributed ledger, thus achieving both equality and sovereignty. Now, why do I claim this? It's a, let me go through the argument. Uh, present cryptocurrencies are what's called permissionless uh, because everyone can log in. So you can have multiple accounts, it could be a bot, it could be your refrigerator, everything can be connected to the cryptocurrencies. Uh, so they, they, they must put barriers to participation, to voting. And that's why this proof of work or proof of stake, you have to prove that you have money to, or a lot of computing power. You have to prove that you really exist by doing a lot of computation or by putting a really a big amount of money on the table. That's how they know you exist. And, but if each citizen has exactly one each citizen, citizenship, an egalitarian, sustainable, distributed consensus protocol, Byzantine agreement can be used. So basically I'm saying that they are stuck with proof of work or proof of stake precisely because they have no one they have no solution for one person one vote. If we have a solution for one person one vote, we can use democratic decisions. And even if we have up to one third of civils or even corrupt people who operate civils, you know, we lump all of them together, the corrupt people and the civils, and they're still below one third, we can use other egalitarian mechanisms such as Byzantine agreement. Okay? So uh, so that's basically the main claim here. Here I don't have results, I have uh, an argument okay, saying that there is a vision, there is a, 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 a way to achieve equality and sovereignty together, so it's worthwhile trying to solve this, uh, this problem of how to grant each citizen with one e citizenship or ensure one person one vote. And we, this is a part of an ongoing work. Uh, we, we, uh, if you if you follow if you you follow the work on internet identities, uh, there, there is a standards group, uh, rebooting web of trust, DID, distributed identities, VC, verifiable claims, verifiable credentials. So all these groups these groups are working to stand to design new standards of internet identity, but they do not specifically aim or sometimes even object to having truthful unique identities. We are looking into using these standards and build on top of that a system with a public web of trust or a trust graph, which has been used theoretically in other contexts, um, to try to achieve these truthful, uh, unique identities for people. And if we achieve that, we can build on top of that uh, uh, a distributed ledger and a, a cryptocurrency with, uh, uh, with democratic uh, control. And I think I'll just show you. Uh, uh, so this is the vision we're working on, uh, and just so you can see it in a broader, broader context, at the bottom we have this how to find predominantly honest identities, public of trust, public identities, so we have one person, one vote, and above it a civil resilient decision making, uh, an egalitarian, this, this is the part I didn't talk about, I talked about the civil resilient and how it can be used for elections, legislation, and budgeting, we're also working on this. And uh, cryptocurrency constitution relates directly to the cryptocurrency because all these topics, all these questions of uh, uh, e-governance, uh, sorry, all these questions of cryptocurrency governance 
uh, always start with a constitution, a written constitution which really determines what are the protocols, etc. So they, they use the word constitution in the very technical sense and we use it both in the technical sense and in the, in the standard sense of constitution and judiciary because we need it and on top of that we, if you have people and democracy and, and a currency then the economy will arise so that's uh, that's uh, that important. Okay, so okay, there are many applications to that. Uh, yeah, if there are questions, I, uh, I mean, I'm interested. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a, we have a small theorem in the paper that uh, shows that 
uh, sorry. This is a supermajority among the real, the genuine voters, not the, not the formal supermajority among the voters, which include the cities, but this is among the real people. So it is uh, uh, sigma over one over six. So if sigma is one third, then it's one third over two thirds, which is half. So it means that you need all the true people, all the general people need to vote to, 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 to move something. But, so that this is really bad. I mean, and of course, if, if, if it's beyond one third, we cannot do it, right? That's the, but let's say that, the, the, that sigma is, is 10%, okay? Then 10% the over 90% is around, you know, 11% or something like that. So if there are only 10% 10% uh, civils, or the, the sigma is 10%, that you are bound on the civils is 10%, then among the honest people, you need 11% supermajority. So it's 61%, 61% of the honest voters need to vote, which is not that bad. Okay, so it is more conservative than 50%. I mean, it's easier to move, to change, to make decisions by 50% supermajority majority, uh, by regular majority. But if it's, you know, if the civil penetration is in the low, deep single digit civil penetration, then you will get 60% majority. So it's no big deal. It's not, doesn't, doesn't hold you, you know, doesn't completely paralyze your democracy. Okay, so that's a practical answer. Yeah. In the end, you always depend on, on estimation of the city. Yes, right? yes. Uh, don't you think that you're going to have a really hard time like, with legal permissions to do that? Yeah, so as I said, there is this whole. Let me go back to my presentation. Uh, ho hopefully, it will be great to show it. Let's see. What happened to my computer? Mm -hmm. Switch desktops. One more. But I agree that it's a, it's a difficult and open 